Hey everyone, today I thought I'd continue my round of responses to uh, my conversation with Paul Vanderclay. Uh, I got another conversation with Paul coming up, so stay tuned for that. Um, but Paul just recently posted our conversation to his channel and has gotten a bunch of responses. And uh, And uh, someone on Twitter reached out to me and said, I've really enjoyed your last episodes. I also enjoyed your responses to comments video. PVK has reposted the conversation on his channel. I'd be interested to hear your responses to some of those comments too. So uh, I thought that that would be another good way in to approach some of this material and uh, yeah, have a have another go at some of this stuff uh, and stuff I didn't get into in my other video. Um, so uh, yeah, let's just dive in. I'll, uh, these are all going to be in response to comments on Paul Vanderclay's channel and his post um, of our conversation. Uh, so uh, try to resolve some hangups for people and uh, and see what comes out of this that hopefully is uh, productive and generative. And I've really appreciated the response so far. It's been really interesting. So yeah, uh, in, in service to this broader conversation uh, unfolding right now around this issue of metamodern Christianity. Let's dive into some of this stuff. Um, all right. So new Gloff 950, 9558 writes, I like this Brendan guy, but he talks like a modernist, if not an ecumenical and reluctant one. Uh, yes. Again, I mentioned that briefly in, well, uh, no, I, at some length actually in my uh, first response video, uh, trying to explain a little bit about uh, where I do land, uh, which is not uh, I don't identify as a modernist um, and uh, have written a lot about the problems with the modernist frame, uh, but uh, I can understand why people got that impression from our conversation. Uh, so I just want to take another opportunity very briefly to uh, acknowledge that, but to uh, qualify that and contextualize it a bit. Um, I made a video uh, in response to my uh, conversation with Jordan Hall. Um, trying to bring in some of the missing modernist framework, which I felt like uh, wasn't so much being included in the conversation. Um, and so uh, that kind of created the opportunity to get into a little bit what that looks like uh, and what sort of dialectical tensions that introduces to uh, the kind of Christian conversation on the way towards a metamodern framing of Christianity. Um, and so uh shared that video with Paul before we had our conversation. That was sort of what... Um, what yeah set us on that particular track of of exploring that kind of uh, line of tension in these different frames. Um, and so in that conversation with Paul, I tried to, uh, yeah, basically um, hold the line on that particular modernist frame uh, to try to see where these fault lines are and to try to present that frame, uh, again, sort of more em emphatically into the conversation uh, as I feel like it is decidedly missing and i can say more about that so um yeah i think in our next conversation i'll try to switch gears a little bit uh, with paul and uh and and not take that frame because i also see it as probably not the most productive angle to get at but i'm also really excited because i feel like it raised a lot of really interesting things that have uh i think been missing from this broader discussion for a long time and i'm really excited to see them coming in uh around this issue of history and historical critical scholarship and how we view the Bible and the Christian tradition in light of all that, after all that, transcending all of that, including all that. Um, so I think it's been productive, but uh, yeah, I uh, wanted to at least again dispel the notion that I'm a, anything like an ardent modernist or ultra-modernist or, um, or anything like that. Uh, but as someone who is trying to frame a metamodern Christianity, which includes pre-modern, modern, and post-modern uh, frames, I think that we need more of that modernist stuff in the mix. So um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm coming at this from. More to be said on that uh, probably later, but let's move on because I think I've made that point uh, at this point pretty clearly. Uh, got a couple of questions about the whole uh, body spirit kind of languaging issue and the issue of like uh, the reality of things uh, in the school spirit uh, discussion that Paul and I were having, um, which I thought, uh, yeah, I didn't get fully developed or or resolved in our conversation. So this is a, another good opportunity to dig into some of that. Uh, one commenter, CN Art Design, notes that he brought this, uh, or they brought this question to their child, and they said, you know, we call this a body, we call a group of students a body, we call a, a company or corporation, uh, you know, uh, why do you think that is? And the child says, uh, I think a body is lots of different parts working together to form a living group, so they're all real bodies. Uh, the commenter goes on to say, even kids can get this stuff without distinctions and metaphor talk. 
Um, another commenter, The Rational Carpenter, writes, Brendan really can't get past his story of what is real. He is willing to accept all these other reels, but keeps falling back on the story that what he experiences as objective reality is real. Brendan, why is that real? Why isn't it a social construct in a fiction of mind? Why is the sun real and not another metaphor? You live within one story of real and are encountering another story of real, and where those stories conflict, you collapse back into the story you have found yourself in. The truth, the real, is beyond the stories, and all attempts to collapse reality into the story will fail. Uh, so, yeah, um, clearly some, you know, some stuff to unpack here around what we mean by real uh, and, and how language uh, plays into this. So, uh, to this last uh, comment um, about... Uh, about social constructs, I would actually say one of the, uh, the the idea that social constructs are real is like a very important insight. And it's, I think, a very metamodern uh, insight uh, of appreciating that um, that what has been described as social constructs doesn't then sort of negate their reality or anything like that, but just re appreciates that they have a reality, but that it's real in a different way than other things. Um, I think that there's something implicit in this in thoughtful postmodern conversations, uh, because otherwise uh, there's not a lot of sense, for example, right, uh, in a lot of maybe the the, the kind of social uh, critique that, you know, race is a social construct, but then you spend a lot of time uh, concerned and, and, and upset and trying to change the way uh, that people are talking about race and how they're interacting with that social construct. And I, I remember I was in a, a DEI workshop uh, back in college and um, kind of just ra posed this question to one of the facilitators uh, saying, you know, if race is supposedly the social construct, then, you know, why is it, why does it seem to have such real consequences? And to my chagrin, they didn't really have any I don't, I don't know if it hadn't occurred to them or they didn't just didn't know what to do with it, but they kind of hedged and then changed topics very quickly. Um, I think, though, some more sophisticated postmodern thinking around this also would accept that social constructs uh, are real in the sense that they have real impacts in the world. Uh, and so we have to disentangle, right? Uh, what we mean by calling something real. And if we say that something is a social construct, that it isn't just sort of then therefore unreal and therefore uh, certainly not negligible, right? Um, so um, there's been a lot of confusion, basically, in postmodern thought around this, which raised the issue of social construction. Uh, and it gets at this issue of like, well, if something is a social construct, therefore, is it not real? Um, and uh, and that's caused a lot of just, yeah, um, let's just say confusion. Uh, so one of the values of, um, of metamodern thought is trying to deal with this issue very directly and and try to frame it in a way that um, that obviates some of that confusion and gets clear about what we mean by this. Because um, one of the postmodern moves was sort of as soon as you can name something a social construct, then uh, we're now we're operating in this area of sort of anti-realism. You know, well, that's not real then. It's just a, so it's just a social construct, a kind of reductionistic thing. Um, and uh, so one of the great things in, in the work of uh, Jason Storm's book, uh, uh, Metamodernism or the Future of Theory, is the presentation of this idea of meta-realism, uh, which is to say that real is a modal term. I talked about this briefly. I raised it uh, when I was talking to Paul, but it didn't seem like a good opportunity to get into this. But I clearly see that um, something like this is really necessary to, to tackle this confusion that is here showing up in this kind of uh, uh, conversation around Christianity. Um, so meta-realism, what is that? Well, um, Jason Storm writes, uh, to coin a term, philosophy that grants different modes of the real is meta-realism, a word that both signals the philosophy's relationship to the broader project of metamodernism and deploys the sense of meta as something that is beyond or higher order relative to other concepts of the real. In this respect, we might say that meta-realism refers to any philosophy that grants that real comes in modes. Meta-realists recognize that uses of the term real necessitate reference to a contrast class. From the vantage of meta-realism, deploying real without contrast class, for example, references to real men without explicitly articulating the alternative, is generally either confused or merely ideological. Um, and obviously there's a lot more in the book outlining this idea of meta-realism and, and how it gets deployed and how it can be helpful. Uh, and the specific way that it responds to the confusion that comes from the conflation with, uh, with social construct and their, and, and, and non-real, et cetera. So what's the kind of uptake from all this is that, um, 
there are different modes of real and that real is a is a contrast class, right? Anytime someone says real, uh, it's like maybe calling something warm, which is like a relative term, like warm relative to what? There isn't like an absolute sense of, you know, warmness, right? Uh, so uh, so whenever you're going to talk about real, you need to set it in a a, a relationship to what it is that it, it, it is supposedly real uh, in regards to. Um, and uh, there are many instances that he provides in this book uh, that kind of get into all the different ways that all the different confusions can creep in if we don't do this, right? He uses a, g a good example of talking about the real Madonna. If you say, oh, that's not the real Madonna. Well, well what are you referring to? Is it in relative to its realness, right? Is it not the singer Madonna? Is it not the 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 uh, religious icon of the Madonna? Or is it an icon of the Madonna, but not the real Madonna, Right. Or is it, you know, it, it, so on and so forth. Um, so what we mean by saying something is real or unreal is relative, not in a not in a way to uh, demote the idea say, oh, it's all relative. That's not the point. It's saying that it's a contrast term. So once you begin to set real in relationship to what is being talked about, you can start to get past the confusion of saying something is or isn't real. And that's what I want to kind of try to do here, because if we're lost in that confusion, uh, you're just lost in this equivocation, right? And I felt, unfortunately, that a lot of my uh, conversation with Paul on this point just sort of kept circling back through a certain kind of equivocation. And I want to name what that equ equivocation is, because I think it's important to uh, to get at some of the issues here. Um, so, uh, like, for example, okay, let's use... use uh, well, let's use Paul as an example. Paul is real, we can say, right? Uh, and we have a sense of what we mean by that, at least uh, incompletely, right? Because we haven't really set a contrast framing. Uh, Santa Claus is real. Uh, okay, well, what do we mean by that, right? But like, to Paul's point in our conversation, you'd have to say that Santa Claus is real because, I mean, Santa Claus is an idea in culture and uh, and it's something that is you know, you can't say that it doesn't exist, right? So Santa Claus is real in that sense, but obviously Santa Claus isn't real in a kind of, uh, well, you couldn't say he's not real fully in a historical sense because there's an historical background to the figure of Santa Claus, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, so this is this is interesting, right? So uh, Paul is real and Santa Claus is real are both sort of true statements. And in the way, in, in the way that Paul was arguing for this, um, it, he was basically trying to, I think, foreground this. So we can't just say it's not Santa Claus is not real. We would have to grapple with uh, with uh, with what that that there are ways in understanding the reality of Santa Claus. So uh, at the same time, though, what I want to paint with this depiction here, right, is that these sentences are very different kinds of claims about reality. To say Paul is real and to say Santa Claus is real is using the same word real, but it's saying, it's assuming that we're talking about different kinds of real here. So, uh, so what is that? I mean, like specifically when I say Paul is real, and here I mean Paul Vanderclay, uh, like we're, I'm talking about historical person um, and that he's he's he is situated in sort of space time. Right. And he has a, a kind of a causal impact on the world. And I could go over and and see him and other people could see him and they could see what he's doing and behaving as. And he's real at the way other people are real. And uh, and we could intersubjectively verify this if a bunch of people were to look at Paul and see Paul, et cetera. Like Paul is real in that way. All right. OK, Santa Claus is real, but Santa Claus is not real in that way. Santa Claus is real as, uh, you know, again, the sort of symbolic character who does emerge out of a historical um, sort of framing or or sort of a, a kind of uh, historical route that then becomes sort of, um, you know, developed and mythologized into this sort of uh, into this sort of concept and framework and mythological uh, cultural uh, you know, construct that is a social construct. Uh, and in that sense, it is real. Uh, like uh, when you when it's Christmas time and you turn on the television and then you see the Coca-Cola ads and there's this figure with a big beard and, you know, he's got, quote unquote, a body. Right. He's got all that. But he doesn't have that all in the, in the way that Paul does. Right. It's a different mode of the real. Uh, Santa Claus is real and Paul is, are re is real, but they are real in different ways. Uh, so I think we're just starting to gesture towards this here, right? And and to Paul's credit and to a lot of the, the you know, the point that's getting, I think, raised in maybe some of these Pajot and, and, and Peterson and other kinds of conversations around the Bible and its, and its material is that they're trying to draw out the realness that isn't just, you know, uh, the kind of simplistic 
historical uh, or even physical real, but the the real in other modes, right? So they're trying to do that, and 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 the and to the degree that they're genuinely hitting on well real things, right? Then that's of of great value, and so you can see a lot of the importance and significance of trying to do that sort of work because, uh, as I say, also suggest in a second, like uh, there are ways in which these can lead to false binaries, right? Um, uh, so so okay. What I would now want to suggest, though, is that um, is that we can relate these, at least these concepts of the real that we're referring to, uh, which we've identified are distinct kinds of real. Um, we can relate this to learning processes, and we can actually see how uh, this can be this gets clarified uh, the more we uh, reflect upon and have experience uh, of and uh, kind of go through the world and acquire information about. Uh, different phenomena and and think about them essentially, right? So, for example, going back to the idea of Paul is real and Santa Claus is real, a child will think that uh, they're real in the same way. There's no distinction between those, right? Like a child, quote unquote, believes in Santa Claus. They have a sense that Santa Claus is real, uh, and that reality is not. There's no conceptual difference there, really, between the reality of Santa and the reality of, of, of a person that they interact with, right? They're the same basic mode of the real. But with age, though, that differentiates. And with age and learning, and, and, and that's the key. When I say, in this case, with age, I just mean because children, as they age, they learn. But what I really mean is the learning process. That's what's actually important. Uh, you can age without learning as well. And so uh, let's say as they learn, um, these different modes of the real do get differentiated so that it, uh, a kid then can see that actually Paul is real in a way that Santa Claus is not real. And this will usually show up in kind of an initial simplistic opposition or a binary, right? Oh, they'll say, oh yeah, Paul's a real person, but Santa is not real. And that'll be sort of the initial reaction to this differentiation of, of what is real. They will have separated out this sense of, oh, this thing can exist in the world, but not be real. And this thing can exist in the world and be real. And it's a simple binary. But what I would suggest is that with additional learning, we can begin to continue that differentiation process and get more sophisticated and nuanced about it, right? So that as we're talking about, Santa does become, uh, let's say, real in certain modes or or one can appreciate the reality of Santa Claus uh, in particular contexts, in particular uh, sort of with an asterisk about what we mean by real. Um there's actually a book by Eric Kaplan called Does Santa Exist? A Philosophical Investigation, right? Like philosophers can tackle this question and, and ask these sorts of questions about the reality of something. But this is a very sophisticated, uh, nuanced sense now of, of being able to di differentiate all these different kinds and modes of the real. So, um, so there's a differentiation process there at work. Um, and, and that I think is also key. And it's one that you get, uh, from, from learning and that you get this sort of simple, um, op uh, well, uh, and beginning with simple conflation and then simple opposition and then sort of, uh, increasingly, uh, nuanced, uh, sort of, uh, relationship and, and differentiation between these different kinds. So, okay, we can grant all that. Now, here's an interesting question and that, you know, I guess I would in this context, like post to Paul, which, which would be like, is Santa real the same way that Jesus is real? Right. Now, this is an interesting question because I think that at many levels, Paul would have some profound distinctions here to draw ab about how different these these uh, these entities are. Um, and in fact, it might even come across as a kind of uh, insult to suggest that Jesus is just as real as Santa Claus. Um, but what I want to point out here, though, is that the entire line of argumentation that was going on with what Paul was saying uh, so far doesn't lead to any meaningful way that would allow us at this point to differentiate why and how they might be different, right? All the arguments Paul is using uh, would apply just as much to Santa Claus, right? Uh, we can't say that Santa isn't real, right? I mean, what do we mean by real in the same way that he was talking about body and spirit? Um, uh, there's a sense of reality there that we have to take seriously in all the ways I've just been talking about, right? But I think we can start to see now that it actually does become important to distinguish a bit more how and why certain things are real, when and, and why we uh, account them real and in what context, right? So how would we begin to tease out the difference between uh, the, real, the reality of Jesus versus Santa Claus? Um, and so I wanted to make that point here because that 
puts us at a sort of we need to we need to go further now. Uh, so I would say that everything that Paul and I were talking about gets us to the point where we can establish that Jesus Jesus is as real as Santa Claus. But hopefully you see that that's a kind of unsatisfactory from a Christian vantage uh, angle to land at. So the kind of almost apologetic argument that's going on here for in support of kind of Christianity uh, ultimately leads you to a place where you'd have to also affirm in the same terms other things that probably Christians wouldn't want to affirm in the same way as their Christian faith or their relationship to Jesus or what have you, uh, because now they're having to basically use all that same line of argumentation to affirm the reality uh, of Santa Claus or other gods, right, or uh, what have you. So um, so we have to dig more now into getting in the sense of, all right, well, well how is this different? Um, and I think that this is actually really important uh, because it, we can begin to tease out some of the ways that the equivocation uh comes in uh, with this issue. Because um, one of the things that came out in my conversation with Paul is that uh, the realness of Jesus is in uh, his historicity and is in the historical relationship of of him with other people and what he did and his resurrection, right? Um, so this got us to the question of physicality. Like uh, when we say real, do we just mean something physically happened? Um, so this is interesting, right? Like, so if you were to press this issue, like, does Santa Claus physically come down chimneys? Then you could begin to say, well, no, he doesn't do that, right? And so in that sense, he's not real like that. But if you were to ask, does, did Jesus physically rise from the dead? And when I talked to Paul, he said, yes. So now we've introduced history and the physical as a, a, a mode of the real that we are actually debating around here, right? So the history and the physical have come back in as a very specific mode of the real that is clearly very important for drawing a distinction between the reality, quote unquote, of Santa Claus and the reality of, of Jesus and, and, uh, and, his, and his nature, right? So now we can start to see why I find it um, problematic if on the one hand we want to say, you're just reducing everything to the physical, uh, in the historical, and that's a very modernist move, uh, and there are different kinds of real that we need to take into account. It's like, okay, grant you all that, then we do that, but then we see that this lands in a place where it ultimately circles back to the historical and the physical being a very important mode of the real that's being factored into the importance of the reality of Christianity and its message and the person of Jesus. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but what we've hopefully at least done is shown that there are modes of the real and that one of those modes of the real is the historical slash physical, and we can differentiate that more and get a lot more clear about that if we want to talk about it. But that is a particular mode of the real that we can refer to. And in most of the conversation with Paul, I felt like we would start to home in on one kind of real, like let's say the the uh, the physical, and then that would get you know disrupted by the point of well, but now we've just reduced this to the physical historical, and that's a modernist move, and we're bringing in all this modernist ontology as a presumption, and this is a different thing. It's like okay, then you then you then you dig into that a bit, and then it winds up circling back to the historical and the and the physical. Do you see what I mean? So. Um, that was sort of the um, equivocation that I felt like we were getting sort of stuck in. And um, so I would propose that it would be of great value to uh, be more clear uh, what modes of the real we're talking about at which moment um, and to clearly define those. And then also to consider, um, let's say, how they relate to each other and how they might be part of a, a broader way of making sense uh, of reality and what different modes of the real offer us in terms of how we understand reality. Um, because, uh, yeah, if we just kind of, if we fail to make that differentiation, then we're going to, um, we're going to get stuck in that kind of loop. So, um, anyway, that could be something that, uh, that, that we try to maybe tease out a little bit more. Um, and I, the last thing I'll say about this point too, is that I have my, a conception of how these modes of the real have, um, successively been teased apart out of the learning process of history, which informs a lot of the way that I see this as well, um, that while there are these different modes of the real, uh, we should appreciate kind of how they emerge, how they emerged in in the context of these different cultural codes of the pre-modern and the modern and the post-modern. Um, like briefly, I would just say to that idea that, right, like if you go way back, uh, history didn't exist as a as a concept, right? So history actually is a, a rather modern uh, notion, let's say, um, and that might that might be obvious and maybe very you know kind of a, a given now in 
in this corner of the internet discussion space, or it might strike people as, as sort of confusing. Um, but what I mean by that, right, is that um, the the notion that we talk about facts uh, without recourse to, um, yeah, some of the mythological and theological language as being causal factors in the story is uh, is is a relatively recent invention for talking about events in the world. If you go way back, you know the origins of literature are in mythology and they're in legends and and stories of that nature uh, that that blend these forms of storytelling in a very um, you know profound way. Think of the Iliad, right? Like, what's the story of the Trojan War? Well, it's a story of of you know basically uh, you could say gods and people fighting together, and and most of the the story is told in relationship to to the gods as like oh and then Ares infused Achilles with a, a divine rage and and then he go, went and did this this sort of a thing right that there's this porousness between uh, individual human actors and these sort of um, cosmic entities that they that kind of possess them or drive their actions and um, there's really fascinating like literature over the past you know uh, century and a half or so really looking at this sort of phenomenon through the lens of like the evolution of consciousness and the evolution of of uh you know different modes of separation and and uh the development of a modern buffered self like Julian Jaynes's um you know uh what is it the evolution of the bicameral mind uh that 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 sort of thing right where like uh he points out that like the whole notion of having this interior subjectivity as sort of some distinct entity that people have privileged access to is sort of a, a rather recent um, invention. I don't think his whole argument holds up, but the basic point is that if you go way back, people had a kind of porousness and uh, they engaged in what we would look at from a modern perspective as a lot of projection, right? So instead of feeling like uh, they just got really angry and and that this was like an emotional state that drove them to do something, that would get framed as they were possessed by the god. Um, and this is something that gets successively sort of teased apart throughout history um, because, yeah, the early early accounts are kind of uh, class uh, are, are are infused with this kind of projection. Um, and it's not until really like, you know, you start getting into the Greek historians where this starts to change and it only starts to. You know, Herodotus is considered the father of history. But even when you read Herodotus, um, uh, he's, you know, uh, one second he'll be telling you what maybe some king did in, in you know, Macedonia. But then the next second he'll be talking to you about like someone jumping on a dolphin and riding it through the ocean. And, you know, so it's it's like a, it's a mixture of sort of what we would think of as is history and, and legend or lore or mythology. Um, and it's probably not until like Thucydides where you finally get basically history in the sense that we would think about it and you know uh but but it's only it's it's a rather rare phenomenon in the ancient world to kind of uh to kind of present events in that way i mean of course you find it in people like tacitus too and and josephus but there's also always this um kind of background subtext also of uh often kind of the religious framing for some of these things and um and this can be thought of in terms of the learning process. So by the time you get to modernity, um, you do get a, a more fully buffered self and uh, the full distinction between sort of inner and outer. And that projection begins to recede and, and more and more accounts are related in terms of just sort of the, the physical actors at play and the circumstances at play. So that when you compare modern historiography to ancient historiography, uh, you get they're very different, right? And so, and and this can be read through the lens of a learning process of increasing accommodation to reality and decreasing assimilation to uh, familiar concepts. So, one of the things I just meant I, I mentioned all this about because I think it's important for it's it's something we have to navigate when we are trying to revalorize um, the the symbolic language um, and to make sense of a you know. A, a statement, right? That like Uncle Sam strode over to Japan and 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 knocked it on its heels or something, right? Like, um, yes, we can appreciate that there's a, a a mode of the real going on there, but we can also appreciate that it's a mode of the real that bears a, a direct analog to pre-modern notions of of historiography in the elision between sort of uh, you know figurative and mythological and projective language and uh, and what we would in a in a modern historical critical lens referred to as sort of uh, historical lens. Um, but I do welcome all of the critique and the 
deeper exploration of that because you don't want to smuggle too much ontology in and trying to do these things. But what you can do is at least note the progression through history, ironically, uh, through which history as a as a concept emerges. Uh, and without getting too meta, that is a whole thing where uh, the more we try to look at the learning process, uh, the more we have to, how would you say, situate that as part of a learning process, right? Um, uh, so, so we wind up getting kind of stuck in the story or a part of the story um, and, uh, and where we are in thinking about um, reality is, is the, if, if the product of a learning process is itself uh, going to be uh, only able to reflect on that learning process at whatever given stage of the learning process it's at. Well, we can come back to that, but um, it, it's an important idea. So anyway, um, I say all of that uh, as some meaningful uh, framing for my approach to this, the modal real. Yes, there's school spirit. And yes, you know, we can talk about that as something real, but we have to distinguish real in terms or regards to what and contrast in regards to what. Um, and to be clear about what kind of real we're talking about in different contexts. Last thing I'll say uh, on this front is um, there's a very important, you know, lens to all this where that brings in the participatory and the sort of uh, consequential aspect of assessing things uh, in terms of their reality by the kinds of um, consequences or outcomes that they produce, right? Um, and and so a lot of this, I mean, this was a big part of Jordan Hall's framing of his conversion and came up in, in the conversation with Paul of sort of like, uh, you know, if something changes you and that transformation is for the better in this relationship to this framing of reality uh, has this really important, uh, meaningful and, and significant, uh, yeah, uh, bettering uh, factor, then that needs to be taken into a very serious uh, account as a criterion for assessing its, its validity. Um, and there's a lot to be said for that. Um, and so, uh, probably I would assume, but Paul and I could talk about this, that one of the big difference between assessing, you know, the reality of Jesus versus the reality of Santa Claus would be adjudicated on, on these terms, right? Like belief in Jesus, it leads to very different outcomes versus belief in Santa Claus. Right. And so that's a significant aspect to, to factor in here. What I would throw in though, is that, um, I found the conversation turned to this distinction between, uh, say, belief in the virgin birth and the kissing of the relic shrine um, to be significant here, because Paul was trying to make the point that, you know, his Protestant anti-relic sense comes out when he sees that happen. And, uh, he, you know, I got the impression that that's sort of regarded as a sort of crude superstition, whereas the virgin birth uh, is different. And so I would bring this up as an example of something worth interrogating here, because uh, if we are using these sort of outcome-based participatory uh, informing aspects for assessing validity, then if people's lives improved by kissing a relic box, that would seem to be evidence for its validity, for its re realness, for its reality. Um, so I'd be curious to hear how that gets distinguished and clarified um, from that kind of anti-relic uh, Protestant stance, um, because it would seem to, again, fall under the same logic. And of course, you could extend this out into other religious traditions too, right? If if someone feels that, uh, you know, well, we talked about praying the rosary, but even, you know, uh, Buddhist meditation chants and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, the kind of prayer wheels, let's say, or whatever kinds of uh, specific kinds of ritual practice that uh, are felt to bring a kind of catharsis or betterment or the Im improvement of one's life, um, same line of argumentation. So how do we then adjudicate between, between quote unquote superstition and, uh, and all that. So anyway, that's just, uh, an attempt at trying to dig a little bit more into that issue of real and assessing body and spirit and all that. Hopefully that makes sense. And, um, you know, we can, uh, we can revisit that. All right, moving on. Uh, Andy Murphy writes, um, this conversation is an excellent case study in the modernist perspective seeking to colonize all other modes of knowing and not appreciating the fractal presence of meaning at different levels. Uh, Paul does a great job teasing out the inherent modernist bias and fudge in Brendan's choice of words, including real. My question for Brendan is this, what's your telos? I could guess his intellectually honest answer might be something like an optimal brain state. Hold for applause. Indeed, if we bestow the crown of the monarchical vision upon the head of the modernist lens, neurochemistry is all there is to it. But is an optimal brain state enough to build a life on, raise a family, steward a nation? Um, yeah, so um, 
So I like this question a lot. Uh, what's your telos? Um, and uh, no, that wouldn't be my answer in optimal brain state. Uh, get ready for this or hold hold for applause. Um, but my sense of the telos and the sense of what it's all aiming towards um, is actually something like the Empyrean that Dante talks about in the Divine Comedy. Um, and what I mean by that is like, uh, well, God, really, you know, it's it's the the ultimate uh, uh, consummating bringing together of all things in a radical unity through diversity uh, that is the maximal you know limit state of goodness and and truth and beauty uh, essentially um uh, so yeah that would be how my teleological orientation and um uh yeah uh thinking about the evolution of life and the unfolding progressive revelation that uh we can view the the christian story as a part of as i laid out in my video on at a modern christianity um where is that all leading I, it leads to something like that singularity of um of 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 christogenesis i guess is as tehard deshardin referred to it the, the omega point something like that right um and uh and so that's what I'm oriented towards is um, the the progression of complexification leading to deeper consciousness, greater greater autonomy, uh, greater care, greater agape, uh, greater love in every sense, and uh, and the unification, uh, the integration and differentiation simultaneously leading to the sort of maximally complex uh, reality. Um, so yeah, I, not a optimal brain state, <laughs> a lot more than that going on in my kind of teleology. Um, and so, yeah, hope, hopefully that clarifies a little bit, uh, again, that, uh, I'm not just a modernist using neuro neurochemistry as the, um, as the be all end all. Uh, okay. Uh, pick 377 writes. I think the impetus to avoid equivocation is really interesting. To my eye, Brendan is trying to maintain a monarchical vision. Uh, specifically, the question seems to be, how can we know systematically what is good? This grates strongly against my intuition that such a system uh, cannot exist. Even as some systems help people along the way, the same system discourages and ship shipwrecks others. Even then, it seems perilous to cast away systems. It is a difficult problem, and the solution, I think, is to be wise or be a saint, but those words point to something beyond words that only arises as a, as a product of living. Uh, yeah, it's a very kind of thoughtful and insightful comment. Um, so the question here, how can we know systematically what is good, uh, is a really interesting one, which, you know, just I can't get into all of that, but briefly, I would to take a quick stab at it. Um, I think this is a really important issue that needs to be framed, um, again, from, from a naturalistic angle. Um, though I hesitate now to use that word because I think it's been maybe, uh, colored, uh, by the recent exchange. So I don't want to put people off by using that. Um, but I can, you know, bring in, I think a sympathetic voice of someone like John Verveke into this conversation, uh, of assessing what is good, uh, needs to happen transjectively. There needs to be that optimal grip between agent and arena and agent and other agents in such a way. Um, and this is actually a, a, a big, big part of my work, uh, which, uh, is really the starting place for my my book that I've been mentioning around all this stuff um, because uh, it's ultimately a theory of meaning um, just as John's work is you know about relevance realization and meaning uh, it's uh, trying to account for that in a way that doesn't just strip meaning from reality in the way that uh, sort of modern objectivism does uh, but neither does it just and, and then place it just purely as like a matter of subjective you know well brain state right that sort of modernist lens that doesn't work uh, but neither does it do what other people want to do. It might be a, maybe a more sympathetic angle uh, for folks uh, in this crowd who are, who are replying here um, of trying to make uh, meaning and value in the good something inherent or intrinsic to reality as though it were objective. Um, I think that that's a more kind of pre-modern approach. And I've, I've, I'm trying very hard to kind of offer uh, my my response to that and the ways that I feel like it won't ultimately be successful and um, and that we there's a much more optimal way of going about trying to answer this question. Um, I'll do that in a different context because it would take a little bit. But just briefly, uh, if people are familiar with John's transjective framing, right, that you've got agents and contexts, you've got systems and environments in relationship to each other. And, um, and so basically in information uh, theoretic terms and in, in complexity terms, one way of understanding this is that um, uh, 
things seeking their viability and flourishing need to uh, relate to reality in such a way that uh, they are processing that information that is enhancing their viability and be attuned to that. Uh, and so um, by virtue of the fact that, say, like a, a living organism has a goal, has an end state that it needs to reach, which is staying far from equilibrium and uh, and achieving certain you know uh, goals like acquiring energy, which is to say food from its environment to maintain itself, there are there's a teleological aspect to to certainly living organisms, certainly animals, and certainly humans, and I would even argue shades down into the level of just entities, physical entities, uh, you know, uh, through processes like dissipative adaptation and uh, dissipative structures, where basically there's relationship, there's a information relating entities to their environment in such a way that can be life enhancing, or let's just say viability enhancing, or not, and that that is the basis, uh, technically speaking, for what complex scientists talk about is meaning. And I think that that shades up in grades of complexity throughout the entire evolutionary complexity stack, ultimately to the point of, you know, where we're at with human meaning making, which is incredibly rich and profound and situated and, you know, very complex social relationships and, uh, and has spiritual aspects and cultural aspects and all this stuff. Um, but I think that you can actually make a very compelling case that uh, that that is how we think about the good um, is is in those sorts of relationships. And uh, if we are thinking in, in terms of that, it can actually clarify the issue of the good quite a bit. So, um, yeah, I, probably in this uh, context, there's not enough time to really unpack all of that. And maybe that landed is very opaque. Um, but I uh, expect that um, there will be other uh, opportunities for me to spell that out. And I'll be re releasing the first chapter of my book actually soon that actually does lay all this out and presents not just a notion or a, a kind of theory of meaning, but also a theory of the good, theory of value, and a theory of the sacred, all that kind of gets grounded out in thermodynamic terms, um, if that makes sense. Um, okay, Ryan Alderson, 7133, writes... We need another conversation to get Brendan's story. What I heard him saying is, I got stuck on modern intellectual issues about the Bible slash religion, and I need everyone else to get stuck there too, or else they're not being intellectually honest like I am. Um, well, I appreciate that you suggesting that it'd be nice to get my story. So I, I thanks for that. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't frame what I'm saying as, as it seems to have landed for you in those terms. Um, I actually uh, briefly would just say that I think um, what I am trying to present is that uh, wrestling with modern historical information uh, and insights about the Bible and religion is a very important part uh, of any form of religion or Christianity that that is attempting to do something in a meta-modern register, just because the the modern is is pretty core to that, um, uh, but not a, but not uh, but not the only aspect of it. Um, so. That's all I'm trying to say. And in the conversation so far, I've been trying to foreground and emphasize that uh, the, the, those modern insights. Um, it is true that I have a background with uh, with the that dialectical tension between the traditional and modern uh, creating a very profound meaning crisis for me. And uh, but I also know that I'm not alone in that, that many other people have experienced that. Um, and I. Uh, I don't think it's necessary that people do get fully tripped up and experience that kind of radical disorientation from that. And I think there are many ways that we could optimally uh, introduce people to religion early on in life and to Christianity in such a way that can more successively, successfully guide them through the learning process so that that um, th that change from the kind of more assimilatory uh, to the more accommodatory aspect that happens in the learning process uh, as you move into the, the modern critical lens isn't so disruptive that it's um, it's sort of prepared for. So that would be something I'd like to see become a real intentional part of, um, of cr Christian catechism, you could even say. Uh, Christian uh, sort of identity formation is um, being very consciously aware of those moments in ego formation and the unfolding and the development of, of the psyche uh, to, to kind of build those in, in a kind of a rite of initiation sort of way um, so that those things can be felt as yes, uh, kind of transitional stages into new modes, but not uh, destructive ones such that it creates a whole, whole kind of uh, intense 
um, conflict in the psyche that can be destructive. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't wish that element of it on people. Um, but I would, I would, you know, wish that people would engage more with the uh, modern critical lens and uh, appreciate it. Um, ideally in a way that, uh, still that actually strengthens their, their, uh, religious sense of meaning and, and purpose in life and, uh, not, uh, feel like there's a profound tension there. Um, but this relates to, um, the next couple of points too, uh, the, these, these comments related to history and the historical critical method, which uh, I'll read now. So Anselmen uh, 3156 writes, uh, historical critical uh, simply means prejudice against the supernatural miracles, God and divine revelation, and the accusation of the writers being liars. Men invent theories to try to avoid truth. So that's one kind of... Uh, take on the historical critical uh that i think is 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 a, a common experience for folks and a, in a similar vein um xavier uh, velasco suarez sorry i'm butchering that uh writes can anybody tell me if it's my ignorance speaking when i'm fed up of textual and historical criticism or any set of such words combined with criticism in my view, a bunch of hubristic, pseudoscientific, rationalistic gibberish for inflated egos who seem to consider themselves so very unique and enlightened that only them, some 18 centuries later, thought of some arcane considerations that had not occurred to the most brilliant theological minds from patristic and scholastic times. Do they offer an earth, any earth-shattering new archaeological evidence that remained hidden from the searching eyes of people like Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Origen, Tertullian, Augustine, or Aquinas? Do they think they were all so dumb not to realize that the writers of the Gospels couldn't be who they say they were, for example? Or were all a bunch of dishonest thinkers less interested in the truth than in pushing an agenda that would jeopardize their livelihoods, their comfort, and their very lives? Or or are they the dishonest ones who think that in the age of reason, people would be so stupid as to uncritically swallow absolutely new interpretations with no credible evidence of any kind? Well, it seems that at, la at least this last bit really worked for them. Um, so that, that, that comment got a lot of likes. Uh, so again, I'm getting, there's clearly a sense in which, right, there's this profound skepticism towards the historical critical method um, and a kind of, um, a kind of very... Uh, like sort of visceral dislike uh, um, for it. Um, so there's obviously not too much I can do in the limited space of of, of this video to uh, tr uh, combat, you know, a lot of that or that sentiment, or to try to, um, you know, uh, present this in a way that maybe folks in that persuasion will find particularly credible or valid. Um, but I would invite folks to entertain at least a little bit more of an open uh, attitude towards these issues um it because uh because well as i keep trying to say if if this is going to be meta modern in orientation then um then we we have to be open to you know the modern uh and to the postmodern as well so um uh that kind of relationship to the historical critical approach um you know is very familiar to me from from a kind of traditional devotional lens uh, in which, you know, I, one that I can very much relate to is I felt, um, I felt a profound distrust, let's say, for, for these sorts of, of lines of inquiry as well uh, when I was just sort of starting out and becoming familiar with them. Uh, so I very much understand that and, uh, you know, want to um, honor people's experiences with that, but also would love to invite them to, uh, to see what, what might be there. Um, uh, that it isn't just, you know, um, these sorts of, uh, kind of bad faith assumptions about what this is all about. Um, I mean, just briefly, right. Um, uh, I would note that historical critical doesn't just mean a prejudice against the supernatural miracles, God and divine revelation. Um, what it, what it does mean though, is trying to, uh, look at, um, materials from, Using the using the insights and the basic methodologies that that have been very helpful in other historical enterprises, um, and there doesn't have to be any even supernatural bias in any of that. Uh, and here, like some rather neutral instances of textual criticism, can be can be really insightful, right? Like um, when you read a text, 
um, and I can try to find the verses for this example I'll, I'll give here, right? Where it talks about, um, I think it's uh, Reuben takes a, uh, a Hittite wife or something, or a, one of the other tribes, uh, he, he marries a woman from that, and it just really bothers his mother. Uh, and you read this line, and then that's, and then it just cuts to a different story, and then you read that story. And then a couple of chapters later, you read, and so Reuben decided to do this thing because his mother was very upset about his wife being from this other tribe. And you're sort of like, oh, that's kind of a non sequitur. Uh, that's interesting. Um, and so there's a kind of like question mark there. Like, why is this coming back in now? And it seems like it doesn't really relate to anything that's going on in this new context. Um, but then when you start using the methods of historical uh, critical study, uh, you can look and see that actually a source got um, got kind of interrupted uh, with a different source. And so you've got this story being told in one source, that, you know, gets to the point where Reuben or whatever, whoever the patriarch was, I'll have to find the, the one I, I, I'm thinking of here. Uh, and, uh, and gets to this point where he marries this woman and it bothers his mother. And then you just get this whole other story from a different source put in because it seemed to relate to something that was going on in that context. And then when that story ends, it just picks up where that other story left off. And it's like, and then the next thing happened. And when you see it that way, you're like, oh, that makes so much more sense. Like I, I get now why that that disjuncture occurred in that text in a way that uh, resolves this this um, this issue that was sort of uh, confusing. And um, and none of that negates miracles, the supernatural God, divine revelation, what have you. It just seeks to explain uh, better what's going on in, in a text to allow us to understand that. Um, and then, you know, of course, provides a lot more insights, uh, because once you can then identify these different sources, you're like, oh, okay, look, that's so interesting. Where this picks up again, it's carrying forward the same language and, and the same sort of theological perspective as it was when the story first started and all that. It winds up kind of, um, there are kind of multiple corroborating aspects to to this sort of approach. So that you're like, wow, this is this, uh, this is very enlightening. This is very elucidating, right? So, um, so I would invite people to think of the historical critical method that way as a way of um, of of uh, opening up um, insight into the nature of the Bible itself. Um, and um, there, do I want to go into all the things? Um, is it is it about inflated egos and, and all of that? Um, bunch of hubristic pseudoscientific gibberish for inflated egos um you know of course always there's going to be in any academic discipline a lot of egos and uh and and gibberish uh and and all that too so um but i would again just really invite people to not think of this uh so negatively um that um that there can be things of value here uh as for these issues of you know do they offer any earth-shattering new archaeological evidence that remained hidden from the searching eyes of people like Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, etc.? Um, actually, the answer there is yes, like they do. Uh, like archaeology didn't exist as a field in the ancient world. Um, and so uh, it's, a, it's a modern science. Um, and so biblical archaeology has, has indeed offered uh, uh, new archaeological evidence that has that has necessitated rethinking how we understand and, and relate stories to to uh, to the archaeological record and to um, the historical record. So uh, yeah, uh, people like Justin Martyr and Augustine and Aquinas didn't have access to that. Um, and, you know, it's up for us, I think, to find meaningful ways of interpreting these sorts of things uh, in such a manner that doesn't necessarily have to negate then the insight or the brilliance or the importance contributions of people like Augustine or Aquinas. Um, you know, they were offering many different kinds of insights about the the tradition and to the tradition in a way that um uh that was very important from that perspective and still remains incredibly important so um do they think they were all so dumb not to realize that the writers of the gospels couldn't be who they say they were for example um again well two things here one um uh there there isn't a sense of you know people being dumb it, a lot of this like the archaeological evidence, for example, is just a matter of what information do people have? Um, you know, if you if you don't have access to certain kinds of information, you can be a genius, uh, but you, it just limits what kinds of conclusions you can draw. So, um, you know, I think that we can retain a profound respect for both the intelligence and the wisdom of these ancient writers with, without uh, also having to conclude that everything that they said, you know, lines up with uh, history. Um, and I think that's important. Um, as for the writers of the gospels not being who they say they were like that's another example right of um 
actually the, the, the writers of the gospels don't say they are anyone. Um, that that's sort of an interesting thing that comes out of studying the texts on their own terms and studying the history of when the attributions were given and when they got their names and all that, um, that those were actually much later. So uh, all the Gospels are anonymous. They, uh, they don't claim to be by anyone. Um, so, uh, so those sorts of things are really important and, and, and insightful, I think. And then again, however we make sense of them, um, we, I feel, can't just ignore that. And that's the only point I guess I'm really trying to make. Um, and then lastly, or were they all a bunch of dishonest thinkers, less interested in the truth than in pushing an agenda that would jeopardize their livelihoods, et cetera? Um, yeah, I talked briefly, I mentioned to Paul, um, like uh, C.S. Lewis has this idea of like Jesus being liar, lord, or lunatic. It's sort of like it's got to be one of these three. Um, and when you kind of you know, count out that he wasn't a liar and he and he wasn't a lunatic, then he must be the Lord. And that's sort of the apologetic kind of framing for that issue. Um, and as I said to him then, like, I, I actually think that that misses something really important about uh, about what we really actually have to grapple with, that um, that's sort of not a false binary, but I guess a false trinary in this instance, um, because it's not about dishonesty. It's not about people being liars. Um, it's about the fact that uh, we are separated from from what happened in a meaningful way that uh, that should give us pause a little bit when we before making confident assumptions about what these texts are and what they mean, um, and that when you appreciate what happened in the um, generations and the time in between the events being recounted and the time that they were written down and the kinds of audiences that they were directed to and the kinds of um, concerns of those audiences and the kinds of presuppositions in the world that they lived in and the genres that they were working with. Um, uh, when you study all of that and you have that greater contextual field of information to deal with, um, then we need to think differently about how we interpret them. I think that's really all it is. And uh, people can be incredibly honest and, and and full of integrity, even to martyrdom and death, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in situations that, yeah, that doesn't have to negate any of that. Um, and so I think that that's important. I think that we just stress that. Um, so last thing here, uh, so dishonest uh, that in the age of reason, quote unquote, people would be so stupid as to uncritically swallow absolutely new interpretations with no credible evidence of any kind. Yeah, again, like I, I just, you know, that's it's sort of the opposite, right? It's it's actually you know, not uncritically, it's the historical critical method. And so um, one of the novel things that that brought to uh, the interpretation of these materials uh, is is the ability to be critical of them in a way that didn't exist in the pre-modern world. Um, and, uh, and we see this, you know, even today in, in other religious contexts where, for example, in a lot of Islamic contexts, it's, it's, uh, it is heretical and, and dangerous to challenge, you know, the, the Quran or the given interpretation of the Quran, um, and to, you know, relate to that text in a way that is deemed inappropriate, um, or, or sort of, uh, yeah, non-devotional, right. To uh, try to apply these critical lenses is, is, a uh, is a uh, something that can get you in a lot of trouble. And uh, that was really the way it was for a long time, even in the Christian tradition. Um, you know, we don't have to go back to like Galileo and all that, but, you know, um, th without, yeah, so I'll just say that, right? And so, um, so one of the things that the modern historical critical approach does offer is this way of approaching these texts that actually is critical of them, and by critical, not meaning like trying to point out all its flaws, but meaning like applying reason and asking questions to the point that it it opens up the possibility of challenging traditional inherited interpretations, right? Um, just being able to say, well, did Paul write this letter, for example, is a critical question. It's a it's a it's asking a, a probing inquiry, and uh, and then it's asking for evidence in support of a particular claim. That's what's meant by critical, um, and so. In the past, if you ask that question, you get in trouble. Um, and uh, actually, um, the some of these things aren't even that novel. Uh, a lot of the issues around source criticism uh, go back to the medieval period. Uh, but um, actually, a lot of and the, this included like Jewish scholars and uh, in the sort of Talmudic tradition who were noticing these inconsistencies in the text and the fact that, like for example, uh, Moses was believed to have written, you know, the Torah, even though the Torah talks about the death of Moses. Um, and uh, and so that created, you know, 
senses that this wasn't maybe that wasn't quite right. Uh, but these people had to basically um, hide those notions and and not really talk about them openly uh, for risk of you know basically expulsion from the religious community. Um, Spinoza got in trouble for for the, these sorts of reasons. And um, anyway, there's there's some information on that background in a couple of works on on this. Uh, I think there's some in Friedman's uh, Who Wrote the Bible talks a little bit about this at the beginning. And uh, Joel Bodden's work, I think the composition of the Pentateuch has some of that in there. So anyway, yeah, not uncritical, just the opposite, I believe. And um, as for no credible evidence, again, that's sort of like, it's, it's, uh, that's, uh, in the words of the dude from the Big Lebowski, well, that's just your opinion, man. No. Um, uh, whether or not it's credible evidence, again, is sort of up for uh, how people want to assess it. But I do think um, at the very least, right, we should be open to thinking about it, considering it. All right. Uh, let's start to kind of close this out. We got a couple more things here uh, under sort of what I've, I'm thinking about as sort of an apologetics framing. Um, and it gets into some of the details. So, Butter Bob Briggs, great handle, writes, why did Luke write more about the nativity than the others? Again, Brendan ignores the handed down tradition. Luke knew Mary and simply asked her. This is not philosophy. It's being, it's people talking about stuff uh, the way they happen, uh, they happen to them. I'm not pulling that story about Luke out of my ass. It is the story handed down, preserved in the church in the same exact way as the NT, as the New Testament itself. Um, well, okay. I mean, I, I don't know what, um, I don't, I'm not sure what that is based on, I guess I'll just say, uh, and, and, you know, what we mean by, uh, well, I'll put it this way. Um, it, in the historical critical framing of this, if, if the claim were to be made that Luke knew Mary and simply asked her, um, that, that would say, no, that's not, that's not how that worked. Um, and there's reasons for, you know, that, uh, like a good example, right. Is, well, if Luke asked Mary then, and she told him, then why didn't, why didn't any of that get communicated to Matthew or to, to Mark? Um, in fact, the only, the only, I'm, I'm familiar with like a tradition, uh, it's from like Papias in the second century talking about M Mark and his relationship, uh, to, uh, Peter. Uh, there is some possibly compelling evidence that the author of Mark knew Peter. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is a, again, a second century. So we're talking about, you know, like, like kind of 80 years after the fact uh, account. Um, and so uh, there could be maybe something to that, right? If you wanted to try to use this line of thinking. Um, but in terms of talking about the tradition handing down this kind of information, um, obviously from a historical critical angle, we'd have to be very critical of those sorts of, of, of issues. This is precisely it, right? Is that we, we get received information from religious traditions that, um, are, that have other things going on in them besides necessarily just preserving quote unquote history, uh, as we tend to think about it today. And so, um, we need to then not just take it on its word, right? We then have to kind of triangulate that and do the critical aspect of that and try to find evidence and try to, you know, uh, so, and not much more I can really say to that. Uh, I do um, think that, you know, the tradition is a really important that we should take that very, very seriously. And we should also especially take it seriously um, in terms of non-historical uh, stuff, you know, um, the rites, the rituals, the liturgies, um, all of that, like tradition, that's, that's where that is so potent and powerful. Um, but whether or not we should use, you know, sort of tradition and kind of oral histories and, uh, in all of that as something to, um, base, uh, historical claims about is I think a, a more, a more difficult claim. Um, and I mean, even where we, can make direct comparisons, right? Like it's not very favorable how that looks. If you look at Eusebius's um, Christian history, for example, uh, this is in you know the era of Constantine. Now um, we can compare what he's writing about to other historical information, um, and it's like it's pretty clear that in that instance, um, there's a lot of propagandizing going on for that uh, for the for the uh, new kind of royal, I'm uh, oh, sorry, uh, imperial uh, Christian. 
situation uh, and for making Constantine look good and all this sort of a thing. Um, and there's just, a, you know, then there's a lot of contradictions in the material that you're looking at and trying to make sense of it. And if you look through it through the lens of, well, what lens makes Constantine look best in all of this, you know, and and given that this is Constantine's sort of official, uh, you know, uh, uh, court uh, historian, um, that kind of clears up a lot of that stuff and and provides an answer to it. And so I only use that as one example because, um, yeah, trying to use the received tradition is precisely what can be so problematic and why we need to triangulate that information using other means. Uh, so anyway, um, Butterbob Briggs goes on to write, uh, some guy 2,000 years after the fact claims to know the disciples of Jesus didn't write the Gospels based on modern criticism. This is why I don't enjoy conversations like this. Uh, Christianity is a faith based based in history, a history preserved physically by people generation after generation. The Gospels are obviously historical and not philosophical. They show the flaws of the people involved. They even say the Son of God could do no great miracles in certain places. The very fact that we have the Gospels at all today is that one generation after another loved them enough to copy them by hand. A physical organization embodied by in local in local uh, by associated congratulations called the Church pres preserved them physically. I'm not quite sure how to read that one. In other words, they were handed from the original author to another person or local church where they began their journey down through history. Same for pre-Christian Jewish scripture like the Old Testament, etc. Um. Yeah, I mean, again, so it's the same basic idea here of, I think I've already covered that, like, uh, uh, yeah, um, tradition makes certain claims and then uh, trying to find uh, certain credible methodologies that can test those claims uh, against other forms of assessment and evidence uh, becomes important. Um, and I mean, again, it, it doesn't take a lot just to consider why that would be the case. Uh, just imagine any other religious tradition, um, right? Why don't we just kind of uncritically accept whatever it says happened, right? Why don't we just assume also then that the Muslim tradition that handed down, you know, information is just right because for all the same reasons, but then that creates a, a contradiction between the claims of the of Muslims versus claims of Christians. And then, you know, what can adjudicate between these two religious contexts, if not something, a more kind of broader uh, secular, um, you know, historical critical approach that can orient them. And again, just to clarify, uh, repeat again, not that that's the total frame, not that that's the absolute frame, but it is a, another frame that can, uh, that can help us relate to this material in a different way that then um, allows us to toggle into these different perspectives at the very least, and not just be stuck in one particular frame, which a metamodern Christianity should be very open to. Um, I found those comments, though, very uh, uh, important. Because I do think that they speak to a certain sentiment and uh, interpretation of the modern historical critical stuff, <laughs> let's just call it, that uh, is, is uh, that is, I would suggest, you know, let's say it's, it's, it strikes me as being a bit closed to it as being, you know, to, to put it mildly, <laughs> right, uh, inflated egos, you know, hawking pseudoscientific gibberish, right? Like, um, I guess at the very least, I just would love to yeah, invite people to be a little more open with this. And also I, I cite them as an example, both because they, they got a lot of likes and seemed to be a popular sentiment that um, we then we shouldn't deceive ourselves uh, believing that just because it's 2024 uh, that, you know, yeah, modernity and we get it next, right? That like um, that the whole insights of modernity as it relates to religious um, materials uh, is is still clearly a contentious issue right and it, and and so i'm just trying to as my best to advocate for a perspective on the christian faith that uh can be true to the tradition and and a lot of the profound value that comes from that but can also grapple and be at least aware of the historical critical stuff and can also grapple and or again at least be aware of the kind of postmodern social constructivists and, and contextual framings and then try to do some kind of synergistic dance with all those i think that's just like by definition what we have to mean by something like a metamodern christianity so um so if we're if 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 we remain very close to the modern frame, uh, it seems like trying to get there will be, uh, I don't know, closed to, to us. So, um, so there's that. Okay. Um, D Dodd seven, two, three, six writes, 
yes, the texts are abhorrent. They have produced so much suffering, misery, and warfare. Not like Stalin, Pol Pot, Mao, Hitler. Those guys were so good-hearted. I'm trying to read this in the ironic voice that I, I know it was written in. The, those guys were so good-hearted, wise, and kind to get rid of religion. All the misery of Christianity, the universities, the orphanages, the hospitals, the almsgiving. Oh, the horror. How wonderful the world would be if it could just go back to, say, Mayan civilization or the Aztecs or the Canaanites, you know, human sacrifice, child sacrifice and the fires of Moloch. Oh, wait. It's so much better to be here in mouse utopia where all suffering has been eliminated. It's the ultimate teleology of billions of years of creation, a warm recliner with a back massager, big gulps, endless Netflix, no marriage messiness, no pesky children, no religious nonsense that actually requires something of us, no suffering. How's that working for us? Um, uh, a, a juicily ironic, uh, sarcastic post. And, uh, and yeah, I think the point is on that one is very well taken. And, uh, so I'm, I would agree with all that. I, I agree with the irony, right. You know, like, uh, like I think anyone who would look at, at religion and the, in the legacy of Christianity and say, Oh, you know, how awful, uh, is clearly missing a huge part of the story. So that's again, why a metamodern framing is so important, uh, to correcting the, the blind spots of modernity. Because uh, there is a lot about the modern approach that does essentially take this kind of attitude. Uh, and as this uh, uh, commentator notes, like, how's that working for us, right? So, um, so yeah, I would totally agree with that. And um, I hope I hope that, I, I mean, I don't know, if you're familiar with my work and the sort of like uh, savage critiques that I offer in it of the kind of modernity that you're describing, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you wouldn't think that that I would be suggesting uh, that. Um, but clearly there's sort of a reaction or a reflex that gets triggered in people when these kinds of modern historical critiques come up around traditional religion in such a way that um, it seems like a binary is being offered of like, oh, bad religion, good modernity, right? And then, and then you can critique modernity and then it's like, well, then what? Then tradition, I guess, right? And that's the whole false binary that the metamodern approach is trying to counter, saying like, nope, there's dignities to all of these paradigms and there's also pathologies. Um, so how do we take the best of each and, and leave behind the worst of each uh, into something going forward? And so I think uh, this captures the the worst of, of modernity very well. Um, and I would also even say that implicit in this, there is the uh, developmental notion, right? Like, do we, do we, you know, do we want to just go back to a Mayan civilization or the Aztecs or the Canaanites with human sacrifice? Like, no, we don't want to do that. We want to go forward. Right. And Christianity was a big part of moving um, at least the Occidental tradition forward in that way, in a way that made strong moral uh, updates and demands on people and uh, yeah, updated the whole worldview and in a, in a very powerful way. Um, I think we just have to get that framing right, right? It's not like, so if you do say, all right, well, you got that imperialistic kind of, uh, you know, culture here, and then you get the axial age Christian stuff going on, and then you get modernity. Um, a lot of people will want to see this as like, you know, this sort of, we went up and now we're going down. Um, and I would suggest if we could see this as still going up, right, in some way, and that even when you tack on the postmodern, there's still some improvement here. There's still some insight that's coming from this ongoing learning process, uh, then that can allow people to appreciate, yeah, there's stuff in the modern world that we want to hold on to. Um, you know, I, again, you know, this is being written on a computer and presumably you're healthy and uh and you know, partaking in the in the joys of modern medicine and uh, and and a in a free public education and all these things, right? So um, there's a lot about modernity that we want to preserve. There's a lot about modernity that needs to be tossed out and transcended. Uh, and the big gulps and endless Netflix and and all that is a big part of that. So um, anyway, I hope that that clarifies my approach uh, to that sort of an of an issue. All right, last one. Neil Daedalus writes. Be nice to this gentleman, hive mind. Walk gently. Uh, thanks, Neil. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I've, I have found it. There's, a, it's been an interesting uh, thing, kind of going through some of the comments and uh, seeing some of the pylons, uh, uh, which is just also the nature of YouTube comments. So I won't read too much into that. Um, but I have always found it to be an interesting dynamic when, uh, when there's sort of like a Christian pylon, right? It's sort of like. 
uh, this guy doesn't get this love and grace and kindness enough. Let's get him, you know? Uh, so, um, you know, that, that just is what it is. At the same time, I've also, people have reached out in a very gracious and kind and loving way. And I've had some great conversations with folks, uh, who, who exemplify, you know, those, that, that kind of Christian openness and that, and that, that kindness. And I've really appreciated that. And, uh, so I welcome more of that. And I hope that, you know, uh, for those who, 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 are annoyed with me that you, uh, you know, I don't know, just give a little grace if you can. And, uh, and, and, and hopefully try to, we can navigate, uh, you know, figuring some stuff out together. And, um, I, I, uh, yeah, would just, uh, appreciate uh, your patience and, uh, charity as we go along, uh, exploring this stuff. But at the same time, having, having inhabited, um, a perspective myself for a long time, uh, that myself, like I can, a lot of these comments, I, uh, I can definitely have seen myself have written as well. Right. So, um, uh, I get, I get it too. Like I spent a lot of years on the internet trying to convert atheists and attacking their spurious lines of argumentation and trying to defend the faith and looking for a conversion experience and all that stuff from, from people. Um, and so now I'm in the position, right. Of like, of being on the other side of that. And so I'm also very sympathetic to, to the way that this can land as a, as like a, as, as it's not, it's, it's not only wrong. It's like, it's just, it's a, it's very, yeah, disruptive, and it seems like it's attacking something very important. And so there's sort of an immune response uh, that also in an evangelical coloring takes on a kind of uh, ah fresh meat, you know, <laughs> like let's bring this guy into the fold, sort of a thing. So I get all those dynamics because that was very much uh, a very alive way of seeing for me as well. And so um, yeah, I, I also just wanted to say that. Um, but anyway. Um, yeah, we'll leave it there. I hope that this was fun and interesting. And uh, I hope, again, it kind of offered some clarification for people around where I'm coming. And um, and I uh, look forward to my next conversation with Paul. And I look increasingly to try to change up my approach anyway, to try to be somehow a bit more, um, I don't know, uh, productive, generative, charitable. I don't feel like uh, my, my approach in our first conversation uh, fully... I don't know, was able to bring that out. And uh, I think we slipped into, you know, more kind of the, these classic kind of fault lines. And so I'm going to try my best to, to both, you know, present the stuff into this conversation that I feel like um, is important that is, is currently being left out. But at the same time, I'm trying very hard to not have that devolve into kind of just a classic dynamic where, um, yeah, this kind of modernist versus traditional dynamic or what have you. Because uh, I just don't think that anyone's interested. I think we are done with that, not interested in that. And um, so I think in that sense, I'm, I'm excited going forward because I think that there's a lot of opportunity for real genuine dialogos where um, I have a lot to learn and I have a lot to... Um, yeah, find a new way of of relating to, you know, it's one thing to talk about integrating the traditional, right? And for some people, that's easier than others, and and because of their their histories, right? Um, but uh, but for me, this is like an opportunity to to really try to find ways through learning from other people, you know, all that best stuff that's there in the tradition that we should be carrying forward, and hopefully, I can, um, you know, lose some. I can let go of some of my, you know, whatever lingering biases are, whatever uh, blind spots or allergies, and really be able to hear that from people and carry it forward into my own conceptions of of what a meta modern Christianity could be. So um, I think that something productive can come from uh, bringing in more of, of this traditional devotional side, and uh, that'll be a challenge for me in some ways. Uh, but um, but yeah, I hope people just kind of. Uh, bear with me as we're all kind of learning together. So, all right. Uh, appreciate everyone's engagement with this. Uh, Godspeed.